Good morning again. Uh, this morning is week two of a sermon series we're doing. I'm thinking it's probably going to be about seven weeks, but don't hold me to that. Um, a sermon series on evangelism. Uh, what does it look like for us to tell the good news to a world that desperately needs it? Uh, and if you missed last week, here's your review. Here are the big points from what we talked about last Sunday. Uh, we looked at the Great Commission from Matthew chapter 28. And the first thing we looked at is that we have to understand Jesus calls us to go. Right? And most of us are never going to go to, you know, the jungles of South America or some far off place. But all of us will go outside of this building. Right? Okay, we're all called to go, and when we go, we do so to take this great commission, this good news of Jesus Christ, and take it to a world that needs it. Okay, we have a calling to go and make disciples. All right, second thing we looked at is that Jesus is king. Um, and this is really good news because there is no way that you and I can go outside of this building and convert anybody to Jesus on our own. We cannot do it. The only way we can possibly do this is if we go with the Spirit of Almighty God in us, doing it with us. Okay, Jesus goes with us because Jesus is Lord of all creation. All right, that was week one. Uh, to help us get into week two, I came across a cartoon that I thought was too good not to share. All right, this is Peanuts. Um, and I think her name is Sally, is the, that girl. Um, and I think the other, the boy is Rerun, but don't hold me to that either. Okay. Excuse me. Okay. Linus and Sally, forgive me. Linus and Sally. Uh, some of us weren't alive for the 1969 Christmas special, but it's all right. All right. Uh, so getting to my sermon, um, the, the joke is, uh, Sally says, I would have made a good evangelist. You know that kid who sits behind me at school? I convinced him that my religion is better than his religion. And Linus says, how'd you do that? She says, I hit him with my lunchbox. <laughs> okay, you laugh because there's a little bit of truth in it, right? Uh, I think chances are pretty high that if you are a committed Christian, uh, if you are sitting here this morning, if you decided to come to church even on the, the Sunday where we lost an hour, um, you probably agree with everything I said last week. Okay, yes, we agree. Jesus calls us to go. I would love nothing better than to tell other people about Jesus. I would love it if my friends and my neighbors and my family who are not Christians would come to know the Lord as their Savior. I'd love to see that baptistry get used more often. We would love to go and do this. Okay, also, I think all of us here this morning would agree that Jesus is King. He's the Lord of creation. He rose from the dead on the third day. We understand Jesus is Lord. We are grateful in the songs that we sing to him. We understand his spirit dwells within us, empowers us, and that we have this great commission. And I think we would agree with everything that we talked about last week. Is that fair? At least most of us are there, right? Now, my problem, though, is how. Okay, how am I supposed to do that? Okay, I agree Jesus goes with me. I know that it's his power that can actually convert people and not my words. Okay, and I know that I can't just go out and hit people over the head with a lunchbox and convert them to the church. So how do we actually do this? Uh, not too terribly long ago, uh, during this last season, I had the great pleasure of going to one of the Falcons football games. Thank you, Jim Milligan, for taking me. That was great. Okay, and while we were going in, there was a street preacher on the corner who was yelling at everybody that they needed to repent or they would burn in hell forever. Okay? Um, now, I didn't see a great crowd of people gathering around him to hear that message. Did he go? Yes. Did it work? Not at all. I don't want to be that guy. Okay, so what do we actually do? Uh, back when I was preaching in Texas... We used to have an annual revival. It, we would bring in a guest speaker for an entire weekend. Um, we would usually try to get some big name guy. Apparently my name wasn't big enough. We tried to bring somebody in. Okay, and we would have big food, right? We'd have a huge potluck with all the fried chicken and all the good stuff. And, and we'd feed everybody and we would invite people. We would send letters of invitation to other churches in our area and try to get everybody to show up for this big revival so that we could carry out the Great Commission and convert the masses. We spent a lot of money on these events. We spent a lot of time on these events. 
who showed up for our big revivals. Okay? Um, the few members at our church who thought you have to be at church every time the doors are open or else God's going to be mad at you, they came. And we would get a few people from the church down the road that felt the same way. They would come. Out of all the years of doing those revivals, do you know how many visitors we had that were lost people looking for the Lord? Yeah, we didn't have any. And you know how many baptisms we did at those revivals? Absolutely none. I don't think our revivals were working. Hey, here's my point. The evangelistic strategies that used to work don't work anymore. Okay, how many of you have attended a good old-fashioned revival? Now, quite a few of you. Uh, my dad was telling me just a couple of days ago uh, how when he was a boy, they used to do revivals for two weeks straight. Okay, anyone want to go to two straight weeks of preaching all night? As a preacher, I don't want to go to two straight weeks of preaching every night. How many of you remember track racks? Okay. Uh, what we used to do is we would have a track in the back of the church. Uh, every church I was at before this one had a track rack. I didn't know if this was a scriptural church or not since we didn't have our track rack. Okay. But the whole idea with having a track rack is that there's little pamphlets that you could give to people and in three quick pages of paper with some proof text ripped out of context, you could convince people with a really simplistic argument that Jesus is Lord. Okay. How effective do you think those are today? About as effective as the revivals we used to have, right? Uh, how many of you remember door knocking campaigns? How many of you have ever knocked on a stranger's door to tell them about the Lord? Okay. How effective is it? Yeah, all the hands went down all of a sudden, right? Our old strategies don't work, right? And the reason our old strategies don't work is because the underlying assumptions no longer hold. Um, I was listening to a podcast the other day, uh, and the, the guy on the podcast, one of my favorite guys, N.T. Wright, he was talking about why the old-style Billy Graham crusades, where you could hold a big tent meeting and have hundreds and thousands of people come in, and lots of people would make their commitment to Jesus at that tent meeting, uh, why it doesn't work anymore. You can't do the old Billy Graham-style evangelism anymore. Um, and the point he made I thought was really good. He was saying when Billy Graham would get up and preach, the majority of the people in the audience had been to Sunday school when they were kids. Nearly everybody in the audience believed that the Bible was the divinely inspired word of God. Most of the people in the audience still thought of themselves as nominally Christian. And so then Billy Graham got up and said, you need to be more committed to Jesus. And everyone said, yeah, you're right, we do. How many people in our world that's not in church this morning think that the Bible is the divinely inspired word of God? How many of them were raised in Sunday school? How many of them still think that they're nominally Christian and they're just not going to church anymore? Not like it used to be, right? Uh, you can't start with people by telling them what the Bible says because they don't come from a place recognizing the authority of Scripture anyways. Uh, about 50 years ago, churches of Christ were listed as the fastest growing denomination in the United States. Now, part of the problem with that uh, is, one, we don't have any denominational headquarters, and so those numbers were made up out of thin air. Okay? Uh, the second problem with that is the majority of the way that we were um, growing is that we were arguing with Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterians that we were more right than they were. Okay, and you could set up Bible studies with people because they still really cared what the Bible has to say about anything. Okay? We don't live in that world anymore. Now, uh, if you happen to meet someone who is raised in Sunday school and who already believes in the inspiration of Scripture, by all means, please set up a Bible study with them. Talk to them about Jesus. But I'm guessing that the majority of lost people that we know at work and our neighbors and our friends and our family, they don't fit into that category. We live in a different world. And to be honest, I don't really want our church to grow through taking people from other churches. I want our church to grow because we are introducing to people who don't know Jesus at all. Does that work? Is that fair? All right, here's my, my big point with all of this. Uh, it took a long time to get there. But evangelism, okay, telling the good news is hard. This is not an easy thing that we are called to do. 
you know, the statistic I keep hearing is that something like 85% of churches in America are in decline. And the 15% that are growing are primarily doing it through transfer growth. So what I am most interested in, though, is the very small percentage of churches who are growing, and they're not doing it by stealing sheep from other pens, right? They're doing it by introducing Jesus to people. What are they doing, and how are they doing it effectively? Okay, we started to answer that question last week. Um, We will continue to try to answer that in the, the subsequent weeks. Uh, But there's one big point I want us to get this week. If you want to take your nap because you missed your hour of sleep, you can do it after you hear this one thing. If you're only going to write down one thing that I say this morning or hear me say one thing, let it be this. Okay, we have to love lost people. Okay, we have to love lost people. Uh, One of my favorite conversion stories in Scripture, uh, one of the times we read in Scripture about where a real revival happened and lots of people came to faith and came to believe in Jesus, it happens in John chapter 4. Hopefully you're familiar with that story. This is a story of Jesus and the woman at the well, right? The Samaritan woman. Um, And I want to jump to the end of that story because it it ends in such an amazing way. Notice John chapter 4. This is starting in verse 39. Verse 39. It says, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. Okay, you want to talk about an evangelistic success? It's in this story. A real revival happens when somebody who was not like them at all came there and spread the good news about Jesus. Okay, so here's the the quick recap of how we got here. Right, Jesus goes to Samaria. Uh, He was doing some ministry in Jerusalem, and now he's on his way back to Galilee, and Samaria lies between the two, so he's passing through. And in order to spread the good news in Samaria about the kingdom of God, he starts by building a building. Because you've got to have a nice facility or no one will take you seriously. And then the next thing he does is he hires a great praise band. You've got to have good, good music. Uh, he gets an executive pastor to handle all the logistics. Then he gets a marketing team with top-notch graphics people for all of Jesus' social media. And then he sets up a weekend worship service that's the coolest service you've ever seen. And the entire town of Samaria comes streaming in to hear his amazing and applicable messages in 20 minutes or less. Revival comes to Samaria by following a really good formula. Right? That's not how it reads. Right? No, the story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman comes right after John 3.16. Okay, which is a passage we read last Sunday. You remember John 3, 16, which talks about, for God so loved the world, right? A lot of times we want to change that and say, no, the world is this wicked place. We're supposed to stay away from it. But scripture insists that God loves the world. He loves it so much, he sent Jesus to come and die for it. Okay, and after we read this text of how God loves the world, then immediately we have this story of how Jesus meets a woman at a well and he shows her love. Right? He loves her where she is. Okay, he saw a woman in need. He loved her in the way that she needed to be loved. And that leads to a conversion. Okay, then her enthusiasm over that causes her to be so excited about what Jesus has done for her, she can't help but share it with everybody around her. Okay, we're going to come back to that later in a subsequent message because you can't do anything to stop enthusiasm. Right? If we could regain our enthusiasm, there's nothing we couldn't do. Okay, that's, that's an important point. Hold on to that one. Okay, but here's my point for this week. Okay, and that is you don't reach lost people by having a perfect church. You reach lost people by loving lost people. Okay, we have to love lost people. And if we love lost people... We won't expect them to come to us on our terms. Uh, Instead, we go to them on theirs. Okay, that woman at the well had a lot of baggage, right? She didn't feel like she deserved a place at the table of the Lord. 
But Jesus went to her where she was and met her where she was and loved her where she was. That's the formula we've got to follow. All right, last month, uh, Barna did a, a study. They interviewed several hundred people. And the question they were trying to get at is, what do non-Christians want from a faith conversation? Okay, the reason I bring this up is because if we're going to go to people on their terms, right, like Jesus did, if we're going to go and try to talk to people the way they want to be talked to, if we're going to love others the way that we would like for others to love us, right, treat others, there's a commandment about that somewhere in Scripture, right? Okay, then we need to know what people want when they get in a faith conversation. Uh, because the research is pretty overwhelming that most people are open to talking about their faith, but the way that most Christians talk about their faith is far removed from the way people want to talk about their faith. Okay, so, how do non-Christians want us to talk to them when we do have opportunity to have a discussion about faith? Okay, I know I said the other thing was the one thing you're supposed to write down, but I want you to write down these three things. Because okay? here's the first one. They want someone who listens without judgment. Okay? Uh, typically, people know that they aren't living right. Okay? How many of us are sinners? Right? Um, we all know that we're not living right. Okay? Lost people know that too. Right? Everybody knows that there's things in their lives that, that should be better, that could be better. Uh, they don't need us to tell them that they're sinners. They need someone who will listen to them anyways. Okay? Number next. Uh, they want someone who does not force a conclusion. Okay, in other words, it's a lot better to have a conversation with someone about faith and talk about what works for me. Okay, so this is the difference between saying, you know, being part of a loving faith community has really worked in my life versus telling somebody, you know what, you really should be in church. Okay, you're saying the same thing both times, but one of them uh, is about us exploring faith together, and the other one is about me trying to force you to a certain conclusion that I want you to come to. See the difference? Okay. Uh, number three on the list is actually a restatement of number two. They want others to draw, they want someone who allows others to draw their own conclusion. Does that all make sense? Uh, if we love lost people, we will talk with them the way they want to be talked to. Okay, again, my big point this morning is we have to love lost people. All right, a uh, couple more quick things and then we'll be done. First one is that we have to love lost people more than we love our own comfort. Okay. Uh, and this is hard. We all nod and agree with that. Um, let me make it harder. Uh, Rick Warren, the guy who's the pastor at Saddleback Church out in California, one of the largest churches in America, one of the fastest growing churches in America, one of the few churches in America that's growing through conversion growth and not just by getting people from other churches. Um, in an interview not long ago, he was talking about what he would do differently if he was to go and start that church all over again. And the number one thing he said is he wouldn't allow church people to determine the kind of music that they had at church. In other words, the way it started is he was asking the, the already Christian people, what kind of music do you like? And then that's the kind of music that they used for the church. And over time, he realized if he wanted to reach lost people, he had to get more modern music and get away from some of the older stuff. All right? Because we love lost people more than we love our own comfort. Now, don't hear me saying that we need to chuck all of the old songs. Okay, but even in the way we worship, we need to keep an eye towards what's going to be most effective at reaching other people, not what do we like the best that keeps us the happiest, right? We claim to follow a crucified Messiah. He did not consider his own comfort first in anything, right? If we claim to follow that crucified Messiah who loved lost people so much that he laid down his life for it, then I have to be willing to lay down some of my comforts if I truly love lost people. All right, um, here's something I don't have permission to say, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, one of the things I'm threatening, and if I can get just a few more people to agree with me, we're going to do it, is name tags. I know, right? Because here's the thing about name tags, is nobody wants to wear a name tag at church, right? I see several of you going, no, I don't want to wear a name tag. Okay, but all of the research shows that visitors and new people like it when churches all have name tags on, and their name tag is the same as everybody else's. They don't have like a special big, hey, I'm a visitor name tag, right? There's looks like everyone else. 
Okay, they like it because they like it when people know their name and when they can know the names of other people. So here's my question. Do I love lost people enough to put on a name tag at church or do I like my own comfort and what I want first and foremost? Okay. Y'all going to fire me if I try to make you wear a name tag? <laughs> we have to love lost people more than we love our own comfort. Fair enough? Some of you are like, okay, and some of you are like, no, I'm still not doing it. I see. Okay. All right, uh, number finally. Uh, we have to love lost people more than we love making our own numbers look good. I want you to imagine that you go back to your college days, right, and you walk up to a girl and you tell her, I'd like to go out with you. I have a personal goal of dating 20 different girls this semester, <laughs> and I'd like you to be one of them. What's she going to say? Well, if you're as handsome as I am, it might work, but for most people, it's not going to get you very far. Okay, imagine instead if you walked up to a girl and you said, I really care about you and think that you're pretty awesome. Would you like to go on a date? Okay, which one's going to get you further? Why? Because does anyone want to be a number? But does everyone want to be cared about? Okay. Um, if we try to talk to people about faith and be like, you know, our church really needs more money in the budget. We really need more people and seats and all this kind of stuff. We're never going to get there. We've got to show people that we genuinely care about them as people and not just as potential members for our church, right? Are we loving people for who they are? Are we loving people because they're created in the image of God and we love them because God loves them and because God loved us even when we were far from God? We've got to learn how to love lost people. And I don't know about you, but I think I've got some work to do in my heart and in my life before I'm ready to claim that I love lost people as much as Jesus loved lost people. I think this is an area where all of us can grow, and I think all of us need to look at our lives and ask, how are we actually doing at loving lost people around us? Because we're never going to be very effective at growing and sharing Jesus with other people unless we can learn to first love them. All right. At this time in our service, we are going to sing a few verses of an invitation song. Uh, during the singing of this song, I will be down front. One of our shepherds will be down front. This is the time in our service where we as the church want to be here for you. We will pray with you or talk with you about anything that is going on in your life. Uh, before we sing that song, though, I'd like to close us with a word of blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you and give you peace. Let's stand and sing.